Hello all and welcome back to the session. This is just a continuation of the previous session into the anatomy of the ureter part 3. I am Dr. Ankit Khatelwal, your anatomy educator. Let's start the session. In the session, we will do the topics which we have left. But before that, just a quick overview of the various new things. We will unlock 20 features that is going on in our an academy for both the iconic as well as the plus subscriptions. You can use the code Dr. Ankit 10 to unlock and uh, this is all the offer prices. This is from 6 month subscription to four year subscription again from six months over here to four years we were iconic we had a uh, an academy and a preferred about and and uh, plus we only have mainly the an academy features That's right remember the code is doctor 10 that you can use more features this is an integrated system wise batch that we discussed in the previous session also starting on 25th of august there is again a five months course that is going to start soon this is your q bank the new q bank which is going to come soon and is going to be very 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 helpful subscribe now let's come to the topic now and not the ureter part two the previous uh, discussion the first uh, part of the ureter we have talked about the general considerations we talked about development we talked about the histology we talked about the course of the ureter we talked about the abdominal part of the ureter and we divided the pelvic part of the ureter into three parts if you remember the pelvic part of the ureter had a first part which was the vertical part it had a second part which was more of an oblique part it had a third part that was inside the bladder known as the intravesical part. The intra. These are the three parts of the pelvic part of the ureter. Okay. Now <clears throat> let us see their relations. Their relations are very important. But before going to the relations, understand that this whole pelvic part is lying below the peritoneum. It is lying where? It is lying below the peritoneum. So it is basically below peritoneum. It will help you in understanding. Second thing is where this pelvic part is ultimately terminating into, it is terminating into the bladder. Now, where is the bladder located? Bladder is located in the pelvis. So we call it as pelvic part. But the bladder is located above the pelvic diaphragm, below the pelvic diaphragm. The urinary bladder is located above the pelvic diaphragm, right? Therefore, this ureter will also be located superior to the levator ani or the pelvic diaphragm. So remember, this is superior to levator ani. Superior to levator ani. That is a very important point. So don't miss it. It is superior to the levator ani. Right? So let us see more of it. So, as we have seen already, let me show you this image also. This is a whole, uh, say, the bony cage, or the bone from the KV region. This is the point where we can call it as a sacroiliac. That is your ischial spine over here. And imagine the ureter is coming from here, 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 and then it moves anterior medially. Then it moves anterior medially. Let us see various cores of it and uh, what it does over here. Remember a few things I already told you that this part of the ureter will be lying above the levator and I and behind and below the peritoneum behind and below the peritoneum right so let us start from the very beginning what happens in the first part so if we talk of the first part first part was the vertical part vertical part where that part of the ureter was actually going uh, through the sacroiliac joint and reaching the ischial spine so from the you can say first part of vertical part in a more uh, theoretical terms you can say that it is from the pelvic brim was only from the pelvic brim the pelvis will start from pelvic brim to the ischial spine. If I may try to give it a name, it will be from the pelvic brim to the ischial spine. Pelvic brim is where? Pelvic brim is at the, where the this uh, L-I-N promontory of the sacrum are there, so it is near the sacroiliac joint. So this location over here is very important. And remember that now we talk of the relations, because simultaneously I will talk of the relations by describing you that this part of the ureter, both on right and left side, at the pelvic brim or the sacroiliac joint, is lies in the front of the bifurcation of the common iliac artery. So relation, we will talk it that it lies anterior to the bifurcation of common iliac artery. Common iliac. Or you can say in other words that it runs along with the origin of the external iliac artery. Origin of the external iliac artery. That is very important to understand. Because at that point only the aorta bifurcates into two common iliac, and at that point the common iliac will divide into external and the internal. So internal iliac will be going behind. Now see what happens over here. What happens over here at this point? What happens is that something very important happens. That as now the ureter has taken origin, so now ureter is passing in front of ureter passes in front of the internal iliac vessel. This point is very important. Passes in front of the internal iliac vessels. 
and now if I specifically talk of females, females, so this very important organ located in front of the pelvic part of the uterus. What is that organ? That organ is the ovary. That organ is the ovary. So ovary lies in the ovarian fossa. So ovarian fossa lies in front of the ureter. Okay. So females, we talk that forms a posterior boundary. The ureter forms a posterior boundary of the ovarian fossa of the ovarian fossa. Nothing like that in males, but in females it is there. You see? So you can say ureter is very close to the ovaries or the uterine tubes. Now what is the importance over here? Why I am telling you this? What is the important? The important lies in that imagine imagine that say this color, this is the ureter. Let us say this is the ureter. Behind it are the vessels over here. Just like two three lines for internal iliac vessels. But this is the ureter what is located over that is ovarian fossa so ovary is located over here if you go to the anatomy female pelvic anatomy then ovary is suspended by the suspensory ligament of ovary so this structure will be what structure will be the suspensory ligament of ovary it has a different name also what is that that is known as infundibular pelvic ligament known as infundibular pelvic ligament what is there inside this ligament so lying inside is the ovarian vessels. So the ovarian artery, if you remember, is a branch from the abdominal aorta. So this structure is also content of this structure. It's basically the ovarian vessels. All the ovarian vessels, lymphatics, all that. Ovarian vessels. Why I'm discussing this? Because I want to tell you the applied part. The applied part is that the ureter is very close to the ovarian vessels. So in doing uh, oophorectomy or as a part of the total TH total abdominal hysterectomy. You like it the ovarian vessels because ovarian vessels themselves will be ureter mitonial. Be sure that it is very close to the ureter, so don't injure the ureter. Point over here is while doing your and ligating the ovarian vessels, be sure that you don't ligate, you don't cut the ureter. Cut the, that is very important, right? That is what I'm telling you. So, so we come to back to the relations. Relation I'm talking about the first part uh, lies anterior to the common iliac artery or, or by, anterior to bifurcation or origin of external iliac, and it lies in front of the internal iliac vessels and it lies behind the ovary fossa. I told you it's a fly part. Okay, now we come to the second part. Let us say the second part of the second part of pelvic ureter. Second part of pelvic ureter. That is interesting. Now it has reached the ischial spine. Now it is going in anterior medial to the ischial spine. This line where anterior medial to the ischial spine. Again, remember below and laterally what will lie in both the sexes. Below and laterally, both in male and female, lies the levator and I. Yes or no? Below and laterally lies the levator. Now, even you can have the obturator internus facie also. Right? Below and laterally. Above what will lie? No. There's some difference over here. What lies above? Above. Above, if we talk of, uh, say, the females, which is more important clinically. Above what lies are very, very important structures. What are those? those that is the inferior. Inferior part of the broad ligament. Inferior part of the broad ligament. So let me tell you again that ureter is not a content of broad ligament. There's a lot of questions. No, what is the contents of broad ligament? Ureter is not a content. And in females, also very, very important structure is that the uterine artery. Uterine artery lies over the ureter, known as the mnemonic is water under the bridge. If you remember the mnemonic, water under the bridge. So uterine artery lies above the ureter. Now imagine the ureter is going from posterior to anterior like this. The uterine artery are coming from lateral to medial. The uterine artery are above and they are going from lateral to medial side. That is very important. So above lies this. Below lateral was the levator ni. And also not just below lateral, but if we talk only of the lower part below in females, there is also a transverse cervical ligament. So you have heard of the Mackenrods ligament. That is a transverse cervical ligament or the Mackenrods ligament. This lies below. Sometimes ureter may pierce this. Sometimes, sometimes ureter may pierce this. Ureter pierces this transcervical. So remember, <coughs> the ureter is going like this. Above is the broad ligament and the uterine artery. Below is the transcervical ligament. Below the transcervical ligament. If I try to make this as this uh, fundus and the open tube and the body and the cervix. The vagina over here, portal section, 
on the sides at the supravaginal part, or you can say the phonic part, this is the ureta. So they're going from posterior to anterior. And these will be your tortuous uterine arteries. They will enter into the uterus. So this is the uterine artery. This is the ureter. Below is the levitrine eye. Below is the levitrine eye. Right? Also do remember that in females, what is lying just medial to it? Just medial to just medial to it is the supravaginal part of the cervix. So medial relation is nothing but the supravaginal part of the cervix. Okay, or you can say the literal phonics. So when you are doing a PV examination, per vaginal examination, the ureters are lying very close to it. How close they are? Around 1.5 to 2 centimeter only from the literal phonics. Literal phonics, they are around 1.5 to 2, 2 centimeter only. And it is not the uterus and the cervix will always lie in the middle line. They are many times tilted to one side. So mostly they are tilted to left side. Call it as a levo rotated. Levo means on the left side. So you can see, we can say that the left ureter, the left ureter is very close to the uh, this is cervix and vagina, left ureter, right? That is very close to the cervix and the vagina. Plus, slightly tilted to the left side. This is very, very important relation. So as it crosses from here, then what lies in front of the vagina is the bladder. So then it will go into the base of the bladder at the superior lateral angles of the bladder, right? These are the sums of the relation. I will revise, repeat them. That see, below is the levator and I. Below is the levator and I. What are the structures lying above? Above there is also going to be peritoneal fold that is a broad ligand. And going from lateral to medial, above is the uterine artery in females. Talking of females, right? Then on the medial respect, you have the vagina and the cervix. Vagina and the cervix, then it will enter into the bladder. But we talk of the males. We talk now of the males. And what happens in males? The differences are see males again below you have the uterine that will be common, but obviously there is no broad ligament, there is no uterine artery. What is there? Lying, you can say superior relation, superior relation to this uh, second part, oblique part of the ureter in males is a vast difference. It's a vast difference, ductus difference, whatever you want to call it as. So these are vast inductive difference, they lie above the ureter, just like the uterine artery was lying above, very important. So, and what lies inferior? Now, as the ureter, because see, in the males, there is simply, there is no uterus, nothing. So as it goes down in front of ischial spine, it will obviously enter into the bladder, right? At the posterior part of the known as the base of bladder. Above it was, above it, there was your vast difference. The inferior relation before it enters the bladder is the seminal vesicle. Remember this. It's the seminal vesicles. Seminal vesicles are lying below. What difference lies above? If we talk of the base of bladder, suppose the base of bladder is plain like this. These are the two ureters which are entering. What difference is coming like this over and then it enters like this. Here you have the seminal vesicles. And what difference will join when they form the ejaculatory duct? This is what opens into the prostate. Okay, so let me just show you the main important relations. Ureter, VD is vast difference. These are difference. These are SVS seminal vesicles. Okay, if you look at the posterior view of the bladder in males, below is the prostate. So this ejaculate duct over here, ED, will open into the prostate. Okay, so these are the important relations. If you talk of the pelvic part of the ureter, pelvic part of the ureter. Now the third part after this. Not over here is the third part was which part? It was inside the bladder, intravesical part. Intra remember this that it is around two centimeter and slightly oblique. I reason I told you, whenever we urinate, whenever we micturate, the detrusive muscle contracts. And to prevent the reflex of urine back into the ureter, because there is no sphincter mechanism over here, like in esophagus and other areas, you have sphincter mechanism. Here there is no sphincter. So when the the trusor contracts, the urine should not go back to the ureter. That is why this third of the intracycle part, 2 centimeters quite a bit, but the lengthier area if we compare the structures in the body. That is the third intracycle part. So no relation over here, it is surrounded by the muscles only. And the trusor will contract, the muscles contract, and this is opening as blocked over. Right. So these were the important, important uh, relations, if I may say so, which you should remember. And let us see other parts, what lies apart from this. Now, talking of the constrictions. 
constructions are not uh, mechanically but they are developmentally which i told in the first part they are developmentally meaning by that there are basically two dilatations in the whole length of ureter there are basically two dilatations so because of two dilatations there occur three constrictions let me tell you how simple words this is say the kidney over here and let us say this is the bladder over here right and if we talk of the just changing the color one second yeah two dilatations imagine one dilatation is going like this developmentally and one dilatation is going like this these are dilatations now this continues into the pelvis so this is constriction number one what is this constriction pelvi ureteral junction so first constriction is pelvi ureteric junction also to let you know that the inside diameter the luminal diameter is approximately 3 mm everything is approximate so you can understand that how much uh, width or how much diameter of the stones because ureteric stones are always secondary they are not found in ureter because ureter has a full of urine and the peristalsis also i'll tell you it is around 2 to 5 times per minute it is not a continuous drop drop flow it is a peristaltic flow 2 to 5 times per minute right so coming back to it in the luminal diameter is 3 mm the luminal the luminal diameter of the ureter is around 3 mm approximately these are two dilatations. These two dilatations, dilatation number one and two, will lead to first constriction, pelvic ureteric at junction. Second constriction over here is at the brim of pelvis, that is at the pelvic brim, right where it crosses the iliac artery, common iliac artery, sacroiliac joint. So that is a bony area, right? Junction of abdominal and the pelvic part of the ureter. That is second constriction. The third constriction is obviously when it enters into the bladder. So that is a narrow spot. Third constriction over here, it is a narrow spot. Right. What we call it is we call it as a vesico ureteric junction. Vesico is for the bladder, vesico ureteric junction. That is the three, three basic anatomical constrictions. So, what are the importance of it? Obviously, the stones, the stones which are falling from above, the stones which are falling from above from the kidney, they may get stuck over here, here, or here. They'll give rise to pain, bleeding, XYZ, a lot of pain. Ureteric colic. Ureteric colic is what? So, they may give rise to a lot of. So, constrictions are very important. And again, uh, Investigations like ultrasound or x ray or CD scans may help you localize and it may help you to look at the size of the stone or any obstruction over there and then may plan your uh, further management. These are the constrictions just telling developmentally uh, how they are. Right? Remember the narrowest is at the junction of the bladder. I move from here, is obviously, this we have seen already. So, that is imagine the first constriction over here. The second construction will be somewhat around here. The third construction is somewhat around here. Just give you, if you take an X-ray, give you that where you should look for the more opacities. Moving from here, looking talking about the blood supply. Now, talk about the blood supply. The few things which you should mind is there is no ureteric artery, so it is supplied by other vessels. Supplied by other vessels. Which other vessels? Whatever vessels are around the ureter. Example, example. You have the renal artery. Supply it. You have the direct aorta, it will supply the ureter. You have the iliac arteries, all the iliac, even the common iliacs, the internal iliacs, they will supply. As you go down into the bladder, you have the vesical arteries, they will supply. In females, you have the uterine arteries, they will supply. Even the ovarian arteries may supply. So, as a ureter is passing down through the whole course, that is a course very important. It is supplied to all these vessels. Even, even, even one thing remember that even the peritoneal, because the ureter is retroperitoneal. So, there are few peritoneal vessels that will supply the ureter. What is the applied part of it? Applied part of it is that whenever you're doing any surgery in the gut, don't just peel the peritoneum from the ureter. You think that the ureter is behind it, so there's no harm. Sometimes there is very important peritoneal vessels which are supplying the ureter from peritoneum. Now, if you separate the peritoneum from the ureter, then there could be a part where the ureter will, can be devoid of blood supply. There can be AVS necrosis. So it can lead to necrosis of the ureter. Remember this. Second thing, this whole supply is forms a longitudinal anastomosis. I'll just show you a figure also. It forms a longitudinal anastomosis and helps you in recognizing the ureter. It has a longitudinal anastomosis. The third part is what I'll show you in the image over here. Look at this image. You can see on the abdomen part and the pelvis part, a lot of arteries from the renal artery, gonadal artery, gonadal artery lies anterior. So the anterior relation, very important relation over here, so the anterior relation, iliac artery, vesicle, uterine, vaginal, so and so. 
The important part is if you look at the abdominal part of ureter, the arteries to it, the arteries are to it are couple are coming from the medial side. If you look at the pelvis part of the ureter, the arteries supplying the ureter, this is the ureter, are coming from the lateral side. So just to tell you that if you are manipulating the ureter while doing any surgery, in the pelvic part, don't manipulate it more, don't don't pull it more medially. Because if you start to pull it more medially, there can be some torn vessels. Same for the abdominal part, don't pull it more laterally. If you start to pull it more laterally, again there could be some torn vessels leading to bleeding and uh, irreversible necrosis and death, and death of the ureter. Now tell me and let me tell you one more thing that in the applied part we will see that if this is a ureter and there is an injury to the upper part of ureter, injury to the upper part of ureter, then due to this longitudinal anastomosis, there can be a U, U anastomosis, ureter, ureteric anastomosis is very simple. Like you have a what do you call it? R and A in gut, resection and anastomosis. If a small part of gut is getting necrosed, you cut it and you join the two ends. Same can be occur, same can occur over here in the upper part of it. In the upper part of ureter, you can have ure, ureter, ureteric anastomosis because of long longitudinal anastomosis. So there is no dearth of blood supply. But if the injury is to the second scenario, is to the lower part of it, or you can say the distal part of it. Then it's better than anastomosis, you make a separate opening into the bladder. You open up into the bladder directly. If in the most distal part of the ureter there is any necrosis, you can make an extra opening into the bladder. That can also be an option, that can also be done. Right? Rather than doing a cutting and joining the ureter, you can directly open the part into the bladder, depending on if it is feasible or not, if length of ureter is safe or not, that has to be checked. But yeah, anastomosis is very beneficial for any organ. Right? So this is the blood supply. Now venous supply again, the same will go directly to the IVC. So venous supply will go back into the IVC. Not much to worry about it. So the uh, take home messages, don't pull the peritoneum much. And uh, wherever you're man manipulating, don't pull it more immediately or laterally. Also doing in the surgery on the pelvis or the abdomen. Next talk of the lymphatic drainage. Now lymphatic drainage will lymphatics always be discussed that they travel along with the blood supply. So therefore, the upper part of the ureter, the upper part of the ureter, it mainly goes to the lumbar lymph nodes. First, it's going to come from the renal artery and all. The middle part of the ureter it goes to the you can say the common iliac lymph nodes. The lower part of the ureter, it will because it is in the pelvis, it will go to the internal iliac, maybe to the external iliac group of lymph. Yes, so the, so that there is no single lymph node in which because it has a more uh, diffuse or varied blood supply. So lymphatic drainage is also quite high. Finally, come to the nerve supply. Now the nerve supply ureter is a uh, your uh, still organ, so it has a sympathetic supply and a parasympathetic. Supply. Sympathetic, parasympathetic, parasympathetic is from the pelvic splanking nerves. Maybe some part of the vagus also. These are S two, three, and four. But sympathetic over here. It's basically from the lower two or three thoracic nerves. So you can say T10, we have T11, we have T12. L1 may go to L2, may go to L2. Sympathetic supplies come from here. Pain is carried by the sympathetic supply. That is the main clinical point. That's the main clinical point. What is the main clinical point over here? That in cases of ureteric colic, that is when the stone from the bladder, uh, stone from the kidney has dropped down into the ureter. And the stone size is say three millimeters, four millimeters, five millimeters. So chance of it getting stuck are more the ureter. When the stones are stuck over there, then obviously they are going to bleed the mucosa, they are going to increase the peristalsis of the ureter. So this is going to be ureteric colic, right? So I'm telling of the stones over here, the stones in the ureter will lead to ureteric colic. The point where over here is that where will the pain go? Where will the pain go? Referred pain will be transferred where that is if you look at the synthetic supply, the answer lies over here. So if the referred pain may go from um, go from umbilicus, obviously in the loin area it will go, it may go to the groin because that is a level of T12 L1, and finally it may go to the proximal part of anterior thigh because that is a level of L2, proximal part of anterior thigh. This is a referred pain depending on where the stone is getting stuck. Plus another thing is if you remember the posterior relations of the abdominal wall, abdominal part of ureter, there was one important nerve which was lying in front of swas major, so it was lying behind the 
ureter. That nerve was genitofemoral nerve. So in case of ureteric colic, that genitofemoral nerve can also be irritated and that genitofemoral nerve root value is around L1, L2 again. So this is also a, this is also a nerve for the cremastric reflex. Cremastric reflex. So in case of ureteric colic, there can be, as in males, same side, there can be slight elevation of the ST because of contraction of the cremastric muscle. There can be cremastric reflex also. So this is a referred pain. Now referred pain will go up till the NTH high only proximal part. It does not go beyond it because that is a nerve supply. Remember the nerve supply, the applied part. Now I told to, uh, talk about peristalsis. I told you that it is not a continuous like you know, the urine is being formed from kidney and then from the renal papilla it comes to the minor calluses, goes down and down and it does have peristalsis. Peristalsis will have a nerve supply obviously. Nerve supply over here is, uh, we can see, you have seen the nerves, but, but, but. Remember, there are various, they are not one like a SA node of the heart, but there are various pacemaker sites over here. Various pacemaker sites, which are said to be a atypical smooth muscles, lying where in the minor calluses, the minor calluses. That is a site. Now, there is not one, but various, various meaning by, let me tell you that, if suppose this is a renal cortex and renal medulla, and renal medulla, you have a renal pyramid, renal pyramid has a renal papilla, from the renal papilla, you have a minor calyx, right? And few of the minor calyxes, they will meet to form the major calyx. And major calyx opens where into the, into the renal sinus. Renal sinus opens into the renal pelvis. And that opens down into the ureter. That is how the ureter starts. Now, there are various what pacemaker sites found where in the minor calyxes, pacemaker sites. And therefore, these actually, they suck the urine from the ducts of Bellini lying in the renal papilla. And from here, the urine starts to flow in peristaltic manner. And finally, as I told you, in the lower or the distal part of the ureter, the urine is thrown into the bladder in the form of like jet sprays. It's thrown into the urinary bladder. So, it is not a peristaltic, it is a peristaltic but not a continuous flow, that is the point. And the reason, the applied part that has various pacemaker sites is, even if, after, if even if so, say the nerves, the, the, the autonomic nerves sub, which supply the ureter, they are even damaged, the peristaltic even then takes place because of this atypical smooth results and minor calyx. Other importance of various pacemaker sites is if you do a partial nephrectomy, if you remove a part of the kidney in say any disease or infection or tumor, the ureteric flow remains intact because there are other minor calyxes which will be there. This partial nephrectomy, there is some, nephr some nephron that is there, some kidney that is left. So those minor calluses will act as space points. So there is a urinary uh, ureteric peristalsis that is important. And uh, that also shows us the muscles, uh, which we see already in histology in the previous session. Right from here, we look at the applied. Applied, we already have discussed a lot, but let us see that if anything is left, then we can cover it up. Stones, we have shown that where can be the stones. So remember, stones, the constrictions your anatomical constrictions. Also the stones look at the x-rays that what are the bony landmarks so you can slide over the bony landmarks. And also look for the referred pain. So that will help in diagnosis. That's same for the radiography. Injuries I told you that uh, in doing hysterectomy and also doing ophrectomy, uh, you have to take care because again hysterectomy as I told you that the uterine artery water under the bridge. So ligate the uterine artery, don't damage the ureter. They don't necessarily damage the ureter. I told you not to too much manipulate the ureter and where not to manipulate. Right? So these are few applied which we have already discussed throughout the session. Comes the congenital anomalies. So there can be few congenital anomalies. There can be much more. There are few important ones. Duplex ureter. That is from uh, one kidney in place of the. See, it is all uh, embryology. Meaning by that when the ureteric bud was entering into the meta metanephric blastema, it uh, divided into two. So there are now two ureters which have entered into the kidney. That is a duplex ureter. The one thing that you have to remember over is known as a, some law which I remember it was Weigert Mayer's law. The law states that the ureter that is coming from the uh, upper pole of the kidney, from the upper pole that is the ureter which is more longer, more longer was the upper pole. That this ureter, if it goes directly separately into the bladder. Then this will be lying more medially and caudally into the bladder. 
that is a Vicat mirror law. And that is also an explanation to it, but don't worry too much. Just remember that the longer ureter will be lying more medially and hardly when it entered in when it enters into the blood. But these duplex ureter may join in between, they may join anywhere else, or they may remain separate also. That is not it. The second is ectopic when the ureter does not open into the base of bladder at the superlateral angles where it normally opens. So it can open anywhere in the post part of bladder. But just remember one thing over here that in males, very important, it can open anywhere. It can open into the prostate, it can open into the prostate urethra, it can open into the seminal vesicles, XYZ. It can open anywhere. But remember that it does not open distal to does not open distal to external urethral sphincter. External urethral sphincter. External urethral sphincter, if you remember, it was lying where in the urogenital diaphragm. There was a sphincter urethry and deep transperineal muscle. That was at the level of membranous urethra. So ectopic ureter in males will open distal or it will open proximal to the membranous urethra. Remember that. Same so ureter seal, ureter seal, uh, you have a cobra head appearance in radiography we call and here the distal end of the ureter is dilated. This land when it is entering into the bladder, that part is dilated, known as cobra head appearance and other investigations, not that much harmful. And then comes a the retrocable. Now name itself suggests that that's, that the ureter here lies behind the inferior vena cava. Retro means behind, cava means IVC. IVC. Now let me tell you one thing over here. That as we talk of the say the right or the left kidney and don't look at the shapes of them but just focus on the ureter. The ureter is the right and the left ureter. Now, this kidney ureter are both retroperitoneal. Same as the IVC. IVC also lies over. IVC lies where medial to the right ureter. This is IVC. IVC lies where a medial to the right ureter. And if we talk of the aorta, if we draw the aorta, aorta lies medial to the left ureter. This is the aorta one. Therefore, the gonadal vessels that will come from here, they will cross in front of the ureter. Same over here, for the superior mesenteric artery will come off, give the right colic. Then the inferior mesenteric artery will come off, it will give the left colic. They all pass in front of ureter. That is the reason. That is the reason, right? That they all pass like this. So, IV, so normally ureter, right ureter is later, but sometimes due to the duplication of IVC or other prenatal anomalies, the ureter may pass behind the IVC. That is known as a retro cable ureter, one of the other kind of anomalies. These are few important points. Now, let me talk about a couple of MCQs over here. And let's start with the first MCQ that a 37 year old lady is admitted to the emergency with severe left abdominal and back. Radiographic evaluation reveals that the left ureter is blocked with a kidney stone because the ureter is completely obstructed. An emergency surgical procedure must be performed. Which of the following landmarks is most reliable for the identification of the ureter? You see, the whole story was a, giving a hint of a clinical care, but the main question was in the last line. A, B, C, D are four options. Which of the following is the most reliable landmark for the identification of the ureter? Which is correct over here? Ureter is located anterior to the left common iliac artery. Ureter is located medial to the left inferior case strip. Anterior to the left gonadal, anterior to the left renal vein. Answer is our option number. Yes, anyone? number a one that is the answer very good other statements are wrong if you talk of the renal vein over here in the hilum of the kidney we have vein artery pelvis anterior to posterior vein is most anterior it is not anterior we already know that it is lying posterior to the gonadal artery it is low, no, nothing relation to the inferior because the inferior gastric artery is going to the rectus sheath inferior gastric artery is going to the it is a branch of external iliac and that goes to the rectus sheath that is no direct relation to the uh, ureter. It lies and yes, it lies anterior to the left common iliac artery. This is important. We have seen this that it lies anterior to this or the origin of the iliac artery. Right? So answer is option number A. True false statements over here. Each statement is a question. The ureter, true false, contains circular longitudinal. We have seen in histology. So it is it is lined by which epithelium? Transitional epithelium. So this is false. This is going to be transitional. Is the nerve by which nerve? L234? No. It was from T10 or T11 to L1 only. So this is also false. Develops from mesonephric duct? Yes, development. Ureteric bud. Descends in the post abdominal wall on a line joining the tips of transverse process. That was an important surgical landmark or bony landmark. So this uh, 3 are 2 and 2 statements are false. 
Okay, that we can easily see. There's one more last question. The following statements concerning the ureters are correct except which is wrong over here. Both ureters have three anatomical sites that are constricted pretty much. We know where they are. Both ureters receive their blood supply from the testicular or ovarian. Yes, volatile vessels are supplied through. Both ureters are separated from the transverse process of the lumbar vertebrae by swas post relations. That is true. Obviously, this is the answer. I don't know what is it, but it should be the answer. Both ureters pass anti no. Both ureters pass posterior to the gonadal vessels. So that is the answer. Option D is the answer. So guys, this was the topic of the ureter. I tried to complete it with the polite as important so that you have a good idea of the basic anatomy of it. But this is a topic which has uh, many times asked the students because they have confusion in the ureter. So I tried to cover up uh, mostly all the points over here. Thank you for your time. I hope you enjoyed. And that's all from my side. Dr. Joseph Dilwal signing off. All the best.